Hello, this evening I've been invited to give a reflection to the Paribhaka. For three, three of you, it's the first Paribhaka after the uh, Upasampada at Vapapong the other day. And this, these 227 rules of the, the traditional Paribhaka discipline is, is, uh, it really is a, a kind of bonding that takes place. And sometimes Western mind just thinks that chanting 227 rules in Pali and nobody really knows what it's all about is a kind of just an empty ceremony. But I advise you just to uh, uh, let go of all your views and opinions because uh, it does have a power. It's a tradition, it's a condition, but also it, uh, it, it traces its origin to the Buddha in India 2,556 years ago, and it also uh, is, uh, allows us to live in, a, in this particular way. Like the Upasambhada uh, the other day at Wat Pa Pong, uh, that was done to allow the three new bhikkhus, who's given permission by the Sangha to live under this Paribhokha discipline, this Vinaya, they have the blessing of the Sangha, the Upachaya, and the monks assembled in this traditional way. So, you know, whether you realize it or not, very powerful condition, that uh, tradition. It's a Sankara, it, it is not ultimate reality or anything, but it, it's a vehicle that's very useful and helpful to us in order to break through the conditioning, the delusions that we all have from our uh, having been born into this uh, sensual world, and this planet Earth, conditioned by our culture, our ethnic background, and and all the assumptions, attitudes, good, bad, right, or indifferent that uh, we acquire, and the aim of this. Is, uh, is to diminish the, the personal importance of oneself. And the, I'm from a background where the personality is given almost supreme importance, individuality, personality, rights, my rights, my views and opinions, uh, and all this are very much part of my own cultural background in this kind of life. You know, you surrender your own personal attachments, not to, not because they're bad or wrong or anything, but because we're letting go of the very objects of the mind that prevent us from seeing ultimate reality. So ultimate reality is, of course, Dhamma. It's the Dhamma. Uh, and it is here and now. It's not something remote or up in the sky. It's not something separate uh, or something you have to get. It's just through the practice of meditation that we learn to relinquish the obstructions to for our seeing clearly the Dhamma. You know, the, the traditional form, the robe we have, the shaven head, and this is a traditional form, but it also it's helpful if we use it in the right way, not as some kind of personal identity, but reminding us that we were given permission to live and practice in this tradition under this Padimokha discipline in order to free ourselves from all delusions. So we can create our identity with being a bhikkhu, being a Theravadan monk, with so many pansas or a samanir or whatever, and and create, we can create any condition into a personal identity. But this is not the point. It's like they, you know, we can use this wisely or unwisely. It's up to you how you use it. Nobody can, can force you to use it in any certain way. But the encouragement is thus. So I found over the many years of my monastic life that fortnightly Padimokha is something I I truly uh, respect because it it really 
helps to free ourselves from a lot of our views and opinions. It's a unitive, unitive a ceremony where we join together as Sangha rather than as personalities or ties or farangs or any other conventional identity that we might uh, have in regards to our self. And the big abstraction of course is identity with the body. Uh, and so this, this uh, human body that we have is uh, very much identified uh, as a personal possession. And so this is uh, you know the reflections on the five khandhas, the six ayatanas, uh, help us to change this view of ourselves as, as a body, as a human form, and in its appearance, its, its gender, its uh, height, its color, its age, and so forth, they're all very much taken for granted as our reality, but when we see them in terms of Dhamma, in terms of the way they really are, they are conditioned phenomena that change according to other conditions. So this is a very simple teaching of the Buddha and actually, you know, the Buddha simplified everything for us uh, because the condition realm is so complicated, it's like a sticky web, you know, it's just if you, if you can't get beyond the sticky web of the Sangsarawata, then we're just stuck onto it and then if we free one hand, we, we stick to something else and so there's no way we can actually, uh, you know, uh, get rid of it. But we can understand it because the human consciousness, consciousness itself is uh, with mindfulness, with sati sampatanya, and then wisdom, we begin to reflect on this experience of being born into a limited form that we identify with. We, we can view the sticky web rather than just resist it or become totally stuck onto it. In the time of the Buddha, you know, this teaching is based on an ordinary human experience like suffering. Dukkha is the first noble truth. And having lived in the UK for so many years, you know, you go to interfaith meetings and, and people ask questions of what did the Buddha teach and, and you, you meet Christians and Jews and, and Muslims and all the rest of the multi-faith movement. There's a strong multi-faith movement in London. It's very good, it's not criticizing it, but then when you discuss Buddhism with, with theistic forms of religion, it's quite, it's very difficult for them to comprehend the particular viewpoint of the Buddha uh, because theistic religions tend to always start from uh, a, a commonly held belief in ultimate reality so we have to uh, we start with you know more being a, having come from a Christian background myself the creed I believe in God is the first thing you have to say and, uh, and then Buddha says there is suffering and so the questions go on. <laughs> Why did the Buddha teach such a depressing truth where there is God is, uh, you know, for some people find that very inspiring. Other people find it revolting, you know, it depends on a viewpoint. You know, some atheists or some anti-religion, religious people or people that have a lot of faith and love the idea of a supreme being that loves us and so forth, they can be inspired or repelled or indifferent. But in regards to suffering, this is a common bond we all share, whether you're male or female, rich or poor, from whatever ethnic background, religious background, it's based on something that is ordinary, even banal. Uh, and something that nobody wants. Nobody wants suffering in a modern society or even primitive societies are always looking for security and happiness uh, in some form or another. And uh, nobody really 
wants to suffer, they want happiness, they want safety, security, certainty, because our lives as a mortal being is very insecure. You know, death uh, is just around the corner, it could happen at any moment. Uh, our lives are, you know, dependent on so many other conditions that we have no control over. And, and so we live in a realm that is uh, continuously changing and that we don't understand. Uh, and we just hope we kind of make it through with the least amount of suffering and hoping to find some kind of permanent happiness. But instead, you know, when we, we look at this realm that we're experiencing, it is frightening. It's not just some kind of neurotic hang-up of any of us. It's, it actually is frightening realm. It's survival realm. Uh, here in the forest, at Nanacha, you know, you look at the animal life, the insect life, the bird life, it's all about survival. And, and, and the human realm, we, is still the same. We're still trying to survive as human creatures in this incredibly irritating, sensitive forms that we find ourselves. When you start contemplating your own body, you realize it is, it's total sensitivity to heat and cold, pleasure, pain. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a continuous condition of irritation. There's always things impinging, irritating, and irritating the senses. And we'd like to have only beautiful sights and pleasant odors and melodious sounds, but these are, you know, these are our wishes, our desires, but according to the way life is on this planet, and this time is just like this. There's melodious sound that's going to be cacophonous ones. If there's, you know, if it's, if we happen to find momentary relief from pain and misery and we have a moment of happiness, we know it's not going to last. That the, that the condition of happiness is very dependent on other conditions and it's not, has, a, and it doesn't have any real core to it, any substance. It's merely condition that arises and ceases according to other conditions. So the Buddha in his first noble truth takes what nobody wants and places it in this position a kind of there is suffering and put, calls it a noble truth. Arya Satcha. So what's noble about suffering? And uh, you know with I used to think that myself. It's, it's pretty nasty, actually, even with uh, the nasty fact of life. When you become cynical enough, you think, how did I ever get born into this terrible place where you're constantly having to survive in, in such a sensitive and vulnerable form as a human body? And then, uh, of course, this realm when you look at, when you, when you contemplate it, you start recognizing it, that it is the way it is, that there, that there is a way to understand this condition realm that we're now experiencing. And this is what the Buddha was pointing to in order, he wasn't making uh, suffering or dukkha ultimate reality. It's not a pessimistic teaching. Uh, oh wow, it's all suffering anyway. It's not that. It's it's turning to looking, observing, recognizing dukkha, not in just passively accepting it in a in a negative mode. It's a positive state when you actually look at dukkha, not blame it on others or, or you try to figure out why or what. It's just. There is dukkha, it's like this. And of course the body is one contemplation. The physical bodies we have, the senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, the mental states. And if we were really any of these conditions, is this what our true nature is? We wouldn't be able to get any perspective on our own physical body or on our sensory experience. 
We, we'd just be bound into it. We'd have just be helpless victims of the conditions we find ourselves in. But because in the human form, the human birth gives us what you might call the Buddha perspective, which is awakened awareness. Like the word Buddha itself is, is a very powerful word, Pali word, but it also, you know, it refers to uh, Gotama, the Buddha, the enlightened one, but it is more than that. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, memory of, of, a, of a wise sage in the past. It's about here and now. And that's what sati, mindfulness, sampatanya, is our ability to, to kind of recognize at this moment it's like this. It, it transcends the time, the, the, the five khandhas, the six ayatanas, it's through this, this uh, particular escape hatch of sati sampatanya, sati panya, that we actually begin to see, have perspective on the sensual, uh, sensory realm, the conditioned realm that we're living in and experiencing in, in whatever state it happens to be in at this moment. Uh, our societies totally believe that time is our reality. You know, we totally accept. Uh, hardly anyone questions the validity of time. And of course we have clocks and calendars and everything and our whole lives are determined by time, uh, you know, by the age of our bodies and we have schedules and so forth that we believe are our reality, our real world. And so, contemplate time, if Pachubhanatama means here and now reality, it's not about practicing now to uh, find wisdom in the future or to attain something in the future. That's uh, how we might think. Our thinking process is based on that. I'm practicing meditation now in order to become enlightened in the future is the scenario that we, we tend to operate from and why we come to mon monasteries or practice meditation at all is because we, we feel something's not right with ourselves and we want to uh, become something that we think is better than what we think we are at this moment. We can hold an ideal of a perfectly enlightened human being and then want to attain that. But contemplate if, if uh, the Dhamma, Amata Dhamma, the reality is here and now and timeless, then it's a matter of just awakening to that reality. It's an awakening presence that embraces this moment. It includes everything. It's not about dividing and sorting out the good from the bad, but it's in recognizing the simple truth that all conditions are impermanent. So we have this basic reflection of Sape Sankarani Cha. All conditions, all Sankaras, all phenomena is impermanent. Now this isn't a teaching to grasp, but it's a it's a reflective teaching. So we don't have to go around believing that, that all conditions are impermanent. Uh, that would be grasping the words. It's an encouragement to observe, to awaken here and now and observe the, your own feeling, your own experience of sitting, standing, walking, lying down in the present, of breathing, inhaling, exhaling, of a state of mind, your mental state, your emotional state, your views and opinions, your sense of yourself, uh, and all that you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, feel, everything. It's here and now, but awareness of it is not conditioned. So, the Buddha called this the uh, escape hatch, the, the door to the deathless. So it means uh, that there is a way out. Uh, of this trap of the being stuck and being endlessly reborn on the sticky web of birth and death. 
And so it's a con now this is not a doctrinal teaching, and you know this what I'm saying now is merely encourage you to practice to find out this yourself. And you don't have to believe what I say, but if it encourages you to be mindful and I've succeeded in my mission. But uh, it's up to you what you do with it. I found that over the many years uh, of practicing this way, you know, in the first one has flashes of insight and, and, uh, and then one easily goes back to the old ha habitual forms. So the point of a monastic life, bhikkhu life, padimokkha, vinaya and all the rest, is a container, it's a vehicle that holds you so that you're not just constantly scattered around according to your own personal conditioning. Because I realized years ago that if I just followed, you know, I needed something to hold me in because my tendency was to be heedless and to operate from a conviction of self as I'm this person, this is my body, what I think, what I want, what I don't like, and it's my reality. So, taking the upasampada is like, uh, you know, your commitment to restraint. You're giving up your personal freedom, rights, uh, personal expressions, uh, your, you know, this, your cultural attitudes and assumptions, your right to, for sexual happiness, your right to have money and, and own property and all the rest. These are our rights, you know, we have a right for sexual life, for money, for success, for freedom and to express ourselves as we happen to feel in the moment. We have all kinds of rights. This is a time of human rights and then people endlessly demanding their rights. And then here you come and give up your rights. <laughs> Never think of that. Why do we give up our rights? <laughs> because uh, something in us kind of knows that if I just endlessly demand rights from the world around me, and it's just, you know, even when I have all my rights, I'm still confused, unhappy, depressed, anxious, worried. It doesn't solve anything, even if everybody supports and gives me everything that I think I have a right to. Where I found living in, uh, in Wat Bapong with Lung Cha, you know, where I gave up all that freedom and rights. This was in 1967, where, where I'm from, from California. And that, you know, the hippie days and drugs and free love and everything was, everybody was demanding their rights to all kinds of things. All the moral boundaries, all the traditions were thrown out the window and it's about right to express yourself, do what you want, uh, experience life to the full, uh, life is a banquet, just enjoy it, that kind of philosophy was rampant in Berkeley when I was there in the early 60s, which is very kind of exciting when you're young. But the result of that kind of, of life is just total confusion. If you just scatter yourself all over just following sensual desires and your own feelings of the moment, the result is that you lose self-respect, you, you get confused, you get addicted to things, you it, you know, it doesn't bring any real happiness or anything that you can respect in yourself. So in the monastic life, just think of what you've committed yourself to in taking upasampada. It's a lifestyle that's worthy of respect. You know, it's set up by the Lord Buddha to live in a way that you can respect and other people respect. So here in Thailand, you, you know, people do respect our life. You know, these monasteries are extremely well supported because people respect the monastic sangha, the bhikkhu sangha. Because it is, in itself, it's worthy of respect. Not everybody in it is 
on a personal level may, may be worthy, but the form is. And we're not talking about individuals anymore, about this is a good monk, this isn't, or what ban or what bar, any of Tommy Umani or anything like that. We're talking about living in a way that is worthy of respect. And so in training myself with Lung Po Cha, where I lost self-respect, living uh, uh, the uh, life of freedom and following desires, uh, then living with, uh, in a way I respected, I respected Lung Po Cha and the monks that I trained with, and I began to respect myself because I'm living in a way that I can respect, that I think is good, is, uh, has a, a great benefit, and is worthy of respect by others. So we live in this way with, you know, we give up our rights, but also in that way we are supported by the goodness, kindness, generosity of the lay communities surrounding us. I lived in England for 34 pansas, so I've lived there longer than I've lived anywhere else. And, and at first I doubted the practicality of living as a Buddhist monk with strict Vinaya in a city like London, or in England, or a European or Western country. I grave doubts, because I could imagine if I walked down the streets of London in one of these robes, people are going to throw rotten eggs at me or make fun of me or do something terrible to me. But that never happened in 34 years. And also, we were very well supported and the four requisites in England were abundant. So that was not a problem, you know, living under the Vinaya discipline and living in this traditional way because it's kind of like a form that that creates respect. It's not about just culture, about Thai culture or Asian culture. It's a form, as I think, it, it, I call it an archetype. It's a kind of form that reminds people of the possibility for liberation, whether they are really that conscious of it or not. You know, maybe they don't know anything about Buddhism or they think Buddhism or, you know, religions are all wrong or superstitious. I mean, how, who knows much about Buddhism in the Western world? But the form has its power, and, and this is a traditional form, so it's not a personal, it's not my view or my preference as a personality. So I'm just trying to align tradition, form, and discipline, and in other words, and, and giving up our rights. But we do have rights with the Vinaya. We have a right to keep the Vinaya. We, like the other day, you're given the right to live under this Vinaya. And the right and the encouragement to do so. We have moral rights. We have a right to say, if, if uh, some important monk tells us to rob a bank, we have the right to say no, no matter how important and powerful that monk might be. We have moral rights. And this is what's lacking in the modern world. It's not about moral rights, it's about individual rights, you know, and rights to express yourself, rights to do what you want, and so forth. It's not about right for the right to keep the five precepts, the eight precepts, the Samanero or the Bhikkhu. So the way things are at any moment is all conditions are impermanent and all Dhamma, Sape, Tama, and all Dhamma is not self. And this self view is the first fetter that, that blinds us from seeing the Dhamma clearly. So there's ten fetters, and the first three are keep us from seeing the path, the way of liberation. And that is uh, Sakyatiti, which is the self-view, the identity with your body, 
uh, you know, the me and mine, my body, my gender, my appearance, my age, and so forth. All this is Sakaya Dichi. And then Sita Patabaramasa sometimes is difficult to translate because it, it gets attachment to rites and rituals, but I don't think that's very helpful because most of us, when we became monks, were not attached to rites and rituals. In fact, we were all against them. So that was second, second pattern, no problem for me. I mean, I, no rites and rituals. I'll go along with the ones they have here, but I'm not, certainly not attached to them. And then, <laughs> but I'm always, there's so much of our, that isn't sakiditi, but is assumptions we make from cultural conditioning. Just attitudes, assumptions that are not particularly personal or sakya ditti problems. They're they're just way we're conditioned to see and interpret experience through being born into this group, into this family, into this culture. And uh, so it's not about sakya ditti, but it's about attachment to conventional forms, to cultural forms, to class identities to, to uh, ideals like being free and democratic these are ideals that most of us hold to ideal progress and development and, and uh, are part of a cultural conditioning and individual rights human rights they're all culturally conditioned attitudes that that we just operate from. We think we operate from these, from a lot of ideals we have about how life should be, how others should be, how oneself should be, how the world should be. And, and of course we're right because we always imagine things should be good, people should be kind, people shouldn't be selfish, they should uh, we should share everything, we're all equal, free, you know, these are all beautiful ideals. But they are sila bhattabharamasa. They come from a cultural conditioning. And it's not to say that sila bhattabharamasa is wrong, it's just to recognize what it is. It's not about getting rid of ideals, but it's putting them in perspective so that you're not just hopelessly operating, reacting to the present moment from conditioned habits, from sila bhatta baramasa. And then uh, the third fetter is uh, which ikicha is doubt, translated as doubt. And that's always being attached to thinking process. We, we you know, we educated people, we want everything defined. Uh, we like to have names for things. Our reality depends on definitions and names and, um, and approval and disapproval, being told what's right and wrong and what, how we should be. And, and uh, so we, when we are attached to our thinking process out of ignorance, out of avicca, then the result is Insecurity, doubt, wichikicha, uncertainty. And it leads to worry and anxiety and fear and all the rest. So if we, now our ability to be mindful of these three fetters is not that difficult. It's not about criticizing or judging, it's recognizing in this present moment whatever you think, whatever you assume, or whatever you're attached to, is a condition. It's like this. And, and so you kind of suspend this tendency to just operate, react out of habit to observing the habit. Uh, to become a, a person, you have to start thinking. As I used to practice in uh, I am Sumato, and I have to think that, that I am Sumato, and then of course everybody agrees. <laughs> but 
actually it's a thought, isn't it? Is I am Ajahn Sumedho is, is a you know, one follows it's a sequence uh, in English subject with a verb and a name. Now observing I am Sumedho is that Sumedho? You know, the request this is a reflective teaching. That which is, you know, I deliberately think I am Sumedho to observe the thinking process because maybe I just operate from that assumption. I'm always Ajahn Sumedho no matter where. Uh, you know, when I'm in my kuti alone, I'm Ajahn Sumedho. When I'm, you know, bathing, eating, I'm always Ajahn Sumedho no matter where I go. And that's assumption. But when you really look at the way things are in the present. I don't go around thinking I'm Ajahn Sumedho. It's not an obsession in my mind. If I was, then I'd be mad. You'd have to pack me off to the hospital in Ubo. <laughs> but if you, if you start observing, this is a awaken, this is a puto, or awakened consciousness observing the thinking process or the psychedelic, the self view you have. It's not making any critical assumptions, but just noticing thinking is like this and, and uh, the self, the sense of my self-worth, my identities, uh, you know, good or bad, right or wrong, are come and go according to other conditions assumptions I make when I first started meditating we brought up as an American as a Christian my very Christian background my whole way of thinking and attitudes and interpretations of Buddhism were very much conditioned by that those those kind of thoughts that way of thinking because that's all I knew how to do when I started thinking it was I'm conditioned to in a certain way like you know the problems that exist between Thai, Thai monks and Frang monks are, are cultural because they, they, they have a different cultural uh, ex way of thinking about themselves than we do So cultural conditioning, Tilapata Paramatha and, and then Wichikicha. So these these are, notice there, you're not born with any of these fetters. They're, these three fetters, they're conditioned after you're born. You're not born with Sakya Ditti, Tilapata Paramatha, Wichikicha. Like a newborn baby doesn't have an ego, uh, doesn't have any cultural biases or assumptions. Uh, or doubts, you know, it doesn't think, so it just, it just, it has instinctual intelligence operating, so it knows, you know, it's a survival mechanism, otherwise it wouldn't know how, let, be able to let anyone know what it needs. But then after a baby's born, then it's conditioned. The mother's usually the, the main one in the beginning here, so then it, Gradually, you know, expands to father, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and, and, and assumptions we make, religious assumptions. We're told what's right and wrong. We're punished for being naughty, and we're we're praised for being good. For obeying mummy, we get praise. For disobeying, we get spanked. So we're conditioned through reward and punishment. We create a sense of ourself. Uh, you know, accordingly. So these three fetters are are not, you know, like tamachar. They're artifices that that we acquire after birth. So then uh, we can reflect on them because they're human made. Our language, our you know, our ego, our cultural conditioning, and so forth. Our identities are all created. Um, by humans who were ignorant with the vicha. So this, uh, 
This is just to put into perspective the first three feathers, why they hinder or block off the path the, uh, to, uh, of ultimate truth. Because until we see through these fetters, we're operating from them always, even in monastic life, if we don't see through these, these three fetters and understand them from the vicha level, from panya, from knowing, then even our monastic life is a form of sakya, ditti, sila, vajraparamasa, which is which is probably better to be a conceited monk than conceited layman, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but monastic life isn't meant for that. <laughs> so, so it's uh, encouragement to wake up and observe. Then the, the, the rest of them, the seven more, are more kind of tamachat, conditions. They're not cultural, they're not ego, they're not, uh, you know, they, they can, they operate because we have, uh, we have a body that, that is, has a, is a sexual form. So we still have raga and patiga, anger and aversion. These are natural conditions, like sexual desires are natural condition. And then, but in, when we see it in as a personal condition, then it be, then we never really understand it. We merely judge it and, and operate from uh, views about sexuality. We don't, and we have no way of understanding it other than identifying fearing that if we're brahmacharya, celibate, and then we try to control it according to a sense of a self, and good, bad, right, and wrong, without understanding. Aversion, uh, batiga, is, is natural. You know, it's part of the survival mechanism of the animal world. Animals have, you know, that anger, hatred, aversion, sexual desire, these are part of the, uh, you know, the forms we have. We've got animal forms. So like uh, Sakatakami still has to deal with aversion and sexual desire. But the difference is that when you break through the illusion of the first three, you no longer interpret these kind of reactions and conditions according to Sakya Ditti Sila Bhatta Bharamasa Vishikicha. You have a Panya level to observe these conditions uh, for what they are. And on and on to Arahant. So it's, it's clearly spelled out in the in these teachings, you know, that as you, it's a, such a precise teaching that, that what we have here in this Theravada tradition, it's a, like a, a, you know, perfect teaching. It, it just points, it keeps pointing and helping, it's directing, it's not, it's not about being attached or becoming anything, it's about using what has been given us to use to awaken attention to the moment. So, you know, being a monk for so long, I've seen so many people become discouraged because they, monks disrobing and so forth, because they never really understood this. They operated from, I'm a Buddhist monk, I've got to get my samadhi, I've got to get the jhanas, I've got to <clears throat> develop this and I shouldn't have these kind of desires I've got to kill my kilesas I've got to get rid of greed, hatred and delusion and fear and this is all Sakya Ditti still so it's not about you know if one can be 
you know, with all good intentions, I've seen people, both lay people and monastics, you know, very serious, very well intended, but never breaking through these basic delusions. Now, it's very clearly stated by the Buddha. It's not like, I mean, I've seen people say that you can't really do vipassana until you have uh, fourth jhana or things like this. Or you've got to get this level of samadhi. And so, this, what does that do to you on a sakyaditi level? You know, coming from that kind of background, it makes me think, I've got to get something I don't have yet. I've got to get samadhi in order to do vipassana. Now, that's not wrong, you know, it's not like there's anything wrong with that, but just observing that when I thought those kind of, when I attached to those kind of thoughts, you know, no matter how diligent I was in practice, is still the practice and the discipline, everything was coming out of delusion. So, like the Buddha used suffering as an awakening truth uh, in order to, you know, not to, not, I've heard also people say that Four Noble Truths are only useful after you've developed samatha meditation. And then I said, what about the Buddha's first sermon? Was it those, he gave that teaching to these already highly attained five disciples, five friends, the Banjawati monks. And of course they were prepared after all their years of asceticism and, and high attainments. But no, this is a, this is, dukkha is not difficult to observe. You don't have to, it's not something remote or high, it's just ordinary. Tamada is the most ordinary reality that we can relate to, anyone, whether, you know, no matter you know, healthy, rich, and famous, and have everything in the world, you still, if there's ignorance, there's going to be suffering from that ignorance. So Lumpo Cha was, uh, you know, before I was actually going to understand much of his uh, formal teachings, I kept hearing this word, tamada, tamada. And he's talking about ordinariness. Not about attainments, high-level attainments, but about awakening here and now to dukkha. To, not to the dukkha that I could say is because of the mosquitoes or the, the pain in my legs, but it's about the dukkha I create out of ignorance. About not wanting mosquitoes, not wanting the pain in my legs. Uh, wanting to get something, wanting to attain the right level of samadhi in order to become a stream enterer or whatever. It's all about wanting to get something I don't have or something around me that I don't like, I want to get rid of it. So this is desire, the second noble truth, gama dana, bhava dana, vipuva dana. Dana is, is an Aramana, it's an object to observe. And in the second noble truth, this is a very clear pointing at Danha. Danha Upatan Avicha is the ignorance of Dhamma, ignorance of ultimate truth. Danha, and then the, uh, comes from that ignorance. I mean, it, Danha arises and ceases. This is a Danha realm. And the attachment upatana to dhanha out of ignorance is the cause of suffering so we can we observe this in our own mind you don't have you don't go outward anymore to notice what other people's desires are but observe dhanha in your you know in your own mind wanting not wanting wanting to become wanting to get rid of wanting happiness, wanting sensual pleasure, wanting longing, and then grasping, like Vipa Vodana, wanting to get rid of desire, is another desire. You can't get rid of desire by trying to get rid of it. 
you, you understand it. Because the awareness is no desire. It's not about desire. When, you, when there's awareness and wisdom, then desire is an object. Whether you grasp it or not, something else. So it's always putting us in this position of puto, awakened consciousness, attention in the moment. Tanha is longing, desire. Not about just sensual desire. Bhava Tanha can be very noble, wanting to become a really good bhikkhu. It could be an aspiration to want to become a really good bhikkhu is a noble desire but it's still you know coming from a vicha and then that desire and then the grasping and and you'll never succeed in becoming a really good bhikkhu through attachment to wanting to become one it's, it doesn't work that way so just noticing this is not judging it's observing so, you know, like I've really practiced observing desire because from the Christian background I'm from, it's like you get rid of desire, I shouldn't have any desires. I shouldn't have anger. You know, anger's bad. I should have loving kindness for all sentient beings. Wanting to become a really good bhikkhu, worthy of the four requisites. I want just loving kindness and compassion and I don't want uh, aversion, uh, jealousy, irritation. I don't want, I, I have a, my personality moves toward the ultimate nobility, like wanting to be a totally free, loving person with no anger, only unconditioned love for all sentient beings. And then the reality of, as much as I, on a personal level, aspire to such noble goals, in monastic life, in a form like this, where you, you know, you're in a community where people are trying their best to be trustworthy, and we're trying not to deceive each other or steal each other's things or hit each other or that, but we still have those kind of reactions, as you know very well. And, any kind of community, there's, uh, it brings up these strong emotions you know, of being irritated or jealous or threatened or this feeling averse, hatred for someone else, you know, where you might aspire to be this ideal bhikkhu, but at the present moment then you think, I've got this evil, evil mood I'm really bad bhikkhu because I hate the sangha and I should love and respect it. And then, you, you know, we all, most of us, Western people, have tremendous guilt complexes. So why, why do we have such strong guilt complexes? Because we can imagine the best, but we can never be that. We can never be the best according to the ultimate superlatives we can create in our mind. And so the awakened awareness is awakened to the humanity of our form, you know, the limitations of our own bodies. They're not ideal forms. You know, they're not. They get old, they get sick. You know, they have to, they have, to have food and we have to urinate, defecate. We have to drink water, we get tired. They get all kinds of illnesses. They get old, and uh, and so it's it's not like a an ideal human form doesn't ever never gets old. But these form and the present one is like this. Old age. I'm experiencing the reality of old age is like this, and so it's not about ignoring or just, you know, not trying to pretend it, it isn't this. But people will say, oh, you're not really old, Ajahn Sumedho. <laughs> well, to me, it, 
I'll be 79 next month. That's rather old according to American views of life. Your mind doesn't get old, and the body certainly does, and it feels like this. So, and it's, so it's not complaining or blaming, just noticing sickness, pain, too hot, too cold, hungry, thirsty, you know, how we look, you know, very aware, you know, you want to look good. You don't want to make a fool of yourself or embarrass yourself or humiliate yourself in public. So we try to, you know, act like perfect forms, but maybe we're experiencing pain and sickness or anger and hatred or some foolish thing, you know, just some minor uh, pettiness, meanness of heart can be, can arise in our jittas in the present moment. But the puto, the satisampachanya, is knowing that. It's not judging. It's not a critical faculty. It's not a judgmental thing. It's a knowing. What is a, like a, a, you know, the thinking mind is a critical, is used for criticizing, for comparing. You know, so in, in language, we always have if it's good, bad, right, wrong, heaven, hell, love, hate, all the rest, you know, each, each condition has its opposite. It's dualistic. Its function is to compare. This is bigger than that. That's smaller. That's better. That's worse. That's uh, beautiful. That is ugly. That's the thinking mind that in its full function is to compare, to criticize, to around the conditioned realm. It has its function. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's learning to free ourselves from the limitation that we create by attaching to thought is our refuge. Analysis, logic, reason, all these, these ways of training the thinking mind, uh, you know, it's through this blind attachment to that that we suffer. The discerning mind from Puto level, intuition, you could call it intuitive awareness, intuition, it's the universal intelligence we're aligning ourselves with. It's not personal anymore. I can't claim that I have it as a person. But as you, as you let go of the person, then it naturally operates through these forms, through these limited forms of a human body, human individual. And it's a discerning ability, it's panya or wisdom level. It discerns suffering and non-suffering. So you can actually know directly suffering is like this, non-suffering is like this. Greed is like this, non-greed just in non-greed. Greed is, if you know, if you, if you have to know what greed is to recognize non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, non-attachment, non-desire. It's not, it's not dualistic anymore. It's, it's, it's not about that this is better than, that non-desire is better than desire. It's noting desire and discerning when it's present and when it's absent is like this. So you begin to recognize that what they call jitwam, empty consciousness, the, the consciousness without attachment is like this. It's a knowing. It's not, it's not a about it's better than anything, it's just knowing this is it's like this. And then the insight comes to develop this knowing, because this we can actually do in, in the, the monastic form itself is, is a condition to help us do that. It's a way of living as a human being in a society that is non-violent, is moral, is not rejecting, it's not condemning the society we're in. We're not trying to reform it or rebel against it. We're not political, but it's, 
It's a knowing that transcends. And therefore we, we make ourselves dependent upon the society, whatever country, whatever society you're living in, for just basic allowances, what is necessary for survival, the four requisites. The four requisites, Buddha said, you need these, you need something to wear, food to eat, shelter, and medicine. So, so these are, you know, we give up our right over holding money and possessions, worldly possessions, so then that, but we, we have a right to, to the requisites because they're survival mechanisms. And they're based at the lowest level you can put anything in. You know, so you've got bindabat food, which means you go with your bowl and whatever, but what anyone puts in it. You know, it's not asking for uh, special diets like I do now. <laughs> but it's about accepting what is offered. And then the robe is based on the bunza cooler cloth, you know. So it's about rags that nobody wants. Like you, Buddha allowed bhikkhus at that time to go and gather rags that the villagers threw away or in the charnel ground. Corpses they used to they wrap corpses in rags, and and we're allowed to go and get gather those rags to make a robe. So he allowed us to wear something. So, in giving up all our personal rights, we take on the right to live in this, into the, in this archetypal form, not to grasp it, but to reflect from it. So, observe your robe, you know, like this robe, the color and the, you know, the fact that it is a certain form, style of robe that dates way back. And, uh, you know, many times one feels very frustrated by this robe, which is not the most practical garment you can wear. But, you know, I've always used it to remind myself, because sometimes my mind goes, gets very worldly and gets full of my own views and my own, you know, what I think is practical and useful at this time in a modern situation, a modern society. And, and then I look at the robe and it reminds me, and it's just, I've given up my own personal views, opinions, my own ditties to live within the restraint that, the, that this robe is a continuous reminder. So it's not like you wear it on festival days on one part and then you can wear jeans the rest of the time. You'll wear it all the time. And, uh, you know, it's with you all the time. You know, you have to even sleep with it. You don't have to wear it in the <laughs> sleep around it, near it. And this is, this is a way of, of using the robe to remind you of what, what your, your purpose is in this life. To awaken, to be awake, use mindfulness, observe, reflect on the way things are. 